you may be asking me, why are we going to study the book of Romans? Can I tell you something? The book of Romans is the most comprehensive book when it comes to theology. The most systematic book when it comes to Bible truth. But more than that, this book, the book of Romans, has transformed many lives. Let me give an example. It has transformed the life of a playboy. This guy is addicted to sex, addicted to pleasure. Then he read the book of Romans. He read a, a part that transformed him. Do you know who is this guy? Saint Augustine. The book of Romans touched his life. Another guy, a very sincere guy who wanted to really please God. He's so conflicted in his heart. You know why? Because he's a legalistic man. He wants to obey the Ten Commandments. He wants to obey the Bible. But he is tortured because he could not. And then one day, he was exposed to the book of Romans. It says, the just shall live by faith. Boom! It changed him. Who is this religious man? Martin Luther. And then you have another man. This time, this guy was a missionary. He was preaching in America to the Indians. When he went back to London, he had no peace. And yet he was teaching the Bible. But no peace. He attended a Bible study. And in that Bible study, they were discussing the book of Romans. And this guy was miraculously transformed. And do you know who is this man? John Wesley. And there are many other men of God who were transformed. They got affected when they studied the book of Romans. So, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to do something different. For the next couple of months, we are going to study the entire book of Romans, chapter by chapter. So, I'd like you to adjust your quiet time. You begin to read the book of Romans every day. You master the book of Romans. And then you begin to know the heart of God, and I guarantee you, you'll be transformed. Can I share with you the quick picture of the book of Romans so that you will understand? Here is a brief outline of the book of Romans, all right? The book of Romans talk about the righteousness of God revealed in the gospel, the righteousness of God. So chapter 1 to chapter 3, our series is this, what's wrong with the world? So for the next few weeks, we will discuss chapter 1 to 3, what's wrong with the world? What is our problem? Then, a few weeks later, we will discuss salvation. You've got to see the whole outline of the book of Romans. It starts with sin, salvation, can I live a holy life, sanctification, the sovereignty of God, and how can I serve God? Do you see the beautiful outline of the entire book of Romans? So, we will talk about salvation. How can we be righteous? Is it possible? We will discuss sanctification. Where do we get the power to live righteously? And then you will discuss in the coming weeks. What about Israel? What does the book of Romans got to do with Israel? It's very important. You understand. Election. Predestination. This is an amazing book. All the theological word you will encounter. From salvation, sanctification, justification, propitiation, all of those theological words that you have been curious about, you will learn. However, I love this kind of uh, study because it's so easy. For us, it's better for us pastors. You know why? Because we know already what we're going to preach about, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. In CCF, I'd like you to know something. We do not teach the Bible for information. We do not try to belabor a chapter or a verse for the sake of information. We preach for transformation. We follow the style of Jesus, the style of the Apostle Paul. You will never see Jesus, you will never see the Apostle Paul preaching word for word from the Scripture. However, he will bring out major emphasis. What is important? So you pray for us. We will learn how to bless all of you when we study together the book of Romans. All right, let's begin with chapter 1. The chapter 1 outline, I like it because it's, 
it's really, it begins with the good news, all right? Chapter 1 talks about the good news. And then, the bad news. Now, which one do you prefer? I like to start with the good news. Do you like to start with the good news before I tell you the bad news? Okay. So today, good news. Next Sunday, bad news. <laughs> but if I start with the bad news, you may be discouraged. So the Apostle Paul was the same. He started with the good news. Are you ready for the good news? Remember, good news, bad news. But what must we do with the good news? You got to share the good news, all right? So turn to your neighbor. Tell your neighbor, share the good news. But can I tell you something? How can you share the good news if you don't know the bad news, right? Don't worry. We'll discuss that together. Romans chapter 1. If you don't mind, I'd like us to read together again. Ready? Go. Paul, a band servant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. The first thing I'd like you to know is how Paul described himself. Paul described himself as a bond servant. The lowliest title, I am a slave. Literally, bond servant means slave. Dulos. You have no idea about slavery. For us, we have house servant. They have rights. They can leave you. They are paid. A slave is different. Paul is saying, I'm a slave the lowliest of title. But it becomes very noble when you connect it a slave of Christ Jesus. His next title is apostle. Now, from the humblest title to the most noble title, apostle, sent out. Notice how he described himself. Set apart for the gospel of God. Ladies and gentlemen, you need to know who you are. Are you aware of who you are in Christ? Paul knew I'm a slave. Paul knew I'm an apostle. Paul knew I'm set apart for the gospel of God. Now, notice something. Today, I'm going to share with you five things about the gospel of God found in Romans chapter 1. What are the five things? There are many more you will discover here, but I will highlight the five things. The first thing I like to highlight, the gospel of God. What, is, what can we learn from the gospel? Listen to me. The word gospel comes from the word Good news. I want to show you a chart, the meaning of that word gospel. The word gospel, literally, I do not know how they did it. The Greek word is euangelion, okay? I want to teach you a new Greek word. The word gospel is from the Greek word what? Euangelion. Now, it's a combination of two Greek words. First, you, good. Eulogy. When people are dead, you say something good. Eulogy. But not just eulogy. Angelon. What does it mean? You proclaim. So the, the word gospel simply means you proclaim good news. Comprende? So what is the gospel? Good news. It's from the English word God plus spell. That's the root word of the Anglo-Saxon word for gospel. You know why? Because God is good. Good news. So today you learn a new word, gospel. What is the gospel? Good news. What is the good news? Let's go back to verse 1. Let's go back. The Bible tells us, set apart for the gospel of God. The first thing I'd like you to know about the gospel, ladies and gentlemen, its origin, it comes from God. It did not originate from men. It is called the gospel of God. This is something important. Our Heavenly Father wants you to know the good news was from Him. Nobody ever forced God okay, to give us the good news. Nobody. God, as a father, He longs for His lost children. And He said, I'm going to give you the good news. This good news, number two, has its origin from God, authenticated from Scripture. Why do I say that? How do you know it is from God? Let's read. Which he, everybody read, promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. The, the thing you need to learn is this gospel is from God. And the proof is authenticated in the Old Testament by the prophets. 
Guys, you have to understand, the gospel was not invented by the apostles. It was not invented recently. It's as old as history. Long time ago, God already thought of what he will do. Are you aware of that? Notice, it says, promise beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. The next thing I'd like you to learn about God, the first one is this. It comes from God. Number two, it's centered on Jesus. Concerning his son, who was born of a descendant of David, according to the flesh, who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ. The gospel is about Jesus. So that you will know the good news is centered on Jesus. Who is Jesus? The Son of David in the flesh and the Son of God. What is the proof that he's the Son of God? By the resurrection from the dead. This is so crucial because I'd like you to know something. The, the gospel is such that once you understand it today, you will never be the same. I want you to help you memorize my message today. Very simple. Say the word CPR. What is CPR? CPR, what? Cardiac, pulmonary, resuscitation. Am I correct, Dr. Glenn? CPR. Today's message is three CPRs. What is three CPRs? Three C's. Comes from God, Christ-centered, and it is compelling. It compels you. And then the last two, P, the gospel is a power of God to save. And lastly, R, the gospel is righteousness of God revealed. Wow, can you now memorize this? CPR, you revive somebody dead. The gospel will make dead people come alive spiritually. Why? Number one, what is the first C? Comes from God, not from men. It was not invented by a committee. It's from God. Number two, it is centered on Christ Jesus. And number three, it compares. It does something to you. And number four, P. What is P? Power to change. And lastly, the righteousness of God. Now, we'll discuss this point by point. I finished point number one. I finished point number two. But I want to show you what does it mean. It, it comes from God. It is Christ-centered. Are you ready? All right? You know, people don't realize how simple the Bible is, all right? Let's look at 1 Corinthians 15. It talks about the gospel. Do you mind breathing aloud? Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you. So he's now going to define the gospel. Number one, I delivered to you as of first importance what I received. So Paul is saying, I'm going to share with you the gospel now. It's about what? Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and he was raised according, on the, the third day, according to the scriptures. So everything is according to the scriptures, referring to the Old Testament. Continue. He appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500. Then he appeared to James, the brother of Jesus. Then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me also. Therefore, the resurrection is the proof that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. Now, I want to share with you how old the gospel is. In the book of Genesis, God already told Abraham. God prophesied, Abraham, in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. You see, God told Abraham, as early as chapter 12 in Genesis, in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Now, let me ask you a question. How can Abraham bless the entire world? Uh -huh. The Bible says, the seed of Abraham. Abraham, through you, through your descendant. Now, who is the descendant of Jesus that is now blessing the entire world? Who? Louder, do you know who? Jesus. 
Look, Galatians 12, Galatians 3 explained this. The scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, it's now a quotation of the Old Testament. All the nations will be blessed in you. So the gospel was not invented by men. God thought of it and God made a promise. Do you remember this saying? The Old Testament is the gospel obscured and the New Testament gospel revealed clearly. You see, the Old Testament gives us a hint about the coming Messiah. Hint! But then the New Testament makes it very clear. Example, many of you are familiar with 2 Samuel chapter 7. For God promised David, David, I'm going to establish your kingdom, and one of your descendants, I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. God promised David, I'm going to use one of your descendants, and his kingdom will be forever. Now, again, it's hard for you to understand this. So, the Isaiah the prophet repeated. Again, it's hard for you to understand if you don't have the New Testament. Everybody read. A child will be born to us. A son will be given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders. His name will be called Wonderful, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. You will be saying, what is this guy talking about? A son will be given to us, and his name will be Wonderful Counselor, meaning omniscient, all-wise, mighty God. Huh? Eternal Father? Huh? Prince of Peace. Then there will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, the zeal of the Lord will accomplish this. My friend, you will not fully understand this until you go to the New Testament. Ah, he's talking about Jesus. You see, Isaiah, no, Daniel, the book of Daniel, tells us, who is this, who is, who is this Messiah? Behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. Notice, son of man. Huh, human. He came up to the Ancient of Days, and to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom. All the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away. His kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Ladies and gentlemen, you will not understand this until you have the New Testament. And until you realize, who are they referring to? Who is this man? Louder. Jesus. That is the gospel. Good news. It comes from God. Nobody forced him. It's nothing new. It's in the Old Testament. It's about Jesus concerning his son. That, my friend, is the good news. But what will this Messiah do? And that's where many of my Jewish friends don't understand. How can Jesus be crucified? How can the Son of God, the coming King, how can He be crucified? How can He be so weak? Ah, you need to understand prophecy. Isaiah 53. By the way, all of this were translated to the Greek language 300 years before Christ. Do you understand? This Old Testament, you cannot fabricate. All over the world, you have thousands and millions of copies. And they talk about the same thing. Look. He was pierced through for our sin. Wow. He, referring to somebody, was crushed for our perversion, our foolishness. The chastening of our well-being fell upon him. By his scourging, we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. Everybody read this now. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Now, who is this him? My friend, if you are willing to study the Bible objectively, humbly, you will come to a conclusion. The Bible is indeed God's love for you and for me, and the gospel is about Jesus. Amen? No wonder 
If you read the New Testament, you see this. The record of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, and the son of Abraham. By the way, do you know why I mentioned this? Bonus is the bonus. How will you know Jesus is the son of David? You see, the Jewish people kept a meticulous record of the descendants of Abraham. Everybody can be traced up to Jesus. The problem is this. After 70 AD, the temple was burned. All the records were destroyed. Well, nobody now knows who their great, 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 you know, your ancestry line. Except when Jesus was born, the records were intact. And that's why you read the New Testament. They say, is this not the son of David? The Bible prophecy has to be fulfilled so that you and I will know Jesus is really the gospel. You and I are not believing somebody's imagination created by human IQ just to have a religion. No, no, no. This is confirmed by historical facts. Jesus died and he rose again. Who is this Jesus? The son of David. I know some of you like to be the Messiah. You cannot be the Messiah. You are not the son of Abraham. You are not Jews, and you're not even the son of King David. So who alone qualifies? Jesus. Is that good news or bad news? Good news. Number three, you have to understand. I want you to realize the good news compels us to be obedience. It will change you. You know why? Let's look at Romans. Continue reading. The good news will also compel us to obedience. You know why? Through whom we have received grace and apostleship. This is the writings of Paul. His own experience, the power of the gospel to transform lives. He said, I received grace and a calling. Have you received grace? Have you received your calling? Guys, you need to know what you are called to do. And then it says here, to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake. You see the true gospel will compel you to obey. Let me repeat. The gospel of Jesus, the good news, will compel you to obey him. If somebody says, I am a follower of Jesus, I know the gospel, but you refuse to obey Jesus, something's wrong with your gospel. I call it fake gospel, counterfeit gospel. A true gospel is from God, authenticated in the Old Testament, it's about Jesus, and it compels you to change. So today, I don't know where you are today. Do you have a sincere heart to obey? It says here, the obedience of faith. Be honest with me. Think about this. Are you obeying? Do you have a heart to obey? That's the gospel. It compels us among all the Gentiles. The gospel is for all. Notice the next verse. Now, from verse 6 to 12, 13, it's an intermission about how the Romans, who are the Romans, how they were changed. So we'll go over it quickly, okay? So I'm going to read to you. Among whom you also, you are the called of Jesus Christ. Now, notice what the gospel will do. Okay? You are now, they are now, the Romans are now called what? Beloved of God. Wow, you are beloved, ladies and gentlemen. Beloved of God in Rome, called us saints. Are you aware that the gospel has made you saints? In this country, what's our concept of saint? A saint is somebody who has died, and then they examine his life, and then they go through a process, and then eventually they will make him into a saint. In the Bible, it's different. The Bible tells us we are saints. For example, I'll give you an example. Addressing to believers. First Corinthians, saints by calling. The Corinthians were very sinful people. But when they come to Christ, they are called what? Saints. Ephesians, oh my goodness. The Ephesian Christians, many of them formerly, they worship goddesses, prostitution. Boom. To the saints. Philippians, my goodness, 
He calls them to all the saints in Philippi. Colossians, to the saints. And now, if Paul were alive, he would write the letter, to the CCF saints. So can you turn your neighbor, tell your neighbor, saint. Call them saint. In fact, I would like you to put their name, but before their name, you put their saint, Ricardo Sartu. Yeah, put your name. Saint. Come on, call each other saint. Do you believe you are a saint? Louder. Why are you a saint? According to the Bible, according to the gospel. Because once you come to Jesus, all your sins are paid for and washed away. The problem is this. Are you acting like a saint? Are you living like a saint? You know, every morning, may I advise you? Just for the next few months, when you wake up and you look at the mirror, you, you must say, good morning, saint. No, remind yourself so that you act like a saint. Because the devil will tell you, you are a sinner, you are a sinner, you are a sinner. You know what? We are saints who may occasionally sin. We are no longer sinners who keeps on sinning. We are saints. You are a saint. Occasionally, from time to time, you will sin. But praise God, you have Romans chapter 6, 7, 8. That will teach you how to practice sanctification. That's in the Bible. You see, the Bible is amazing. So, he tells them, you are beloved, you are a saint, and then you know what Paul tells them? I long to see you. God whom I serve in my spirit for the preaching of the gospel of his son. Now, Paul is writing to the Romans, is my witness how unceasingly I make mention of you, always in my prayers, making requests, if perhaps at last, by the will of God, I may come to you. Do you see the heart of Paul? He loves these people. I'm praying for you. You know, if you tell me you love me, I know you do. Pray for me. If you tell somebody I love you, you pray for them. That's how you show love. You pray for people. And the gospel will make you pray for people. And then it continues. I long to see that I may impart some spiritual gift to you that you may be established. What sports this are? I want to bless the Romans. That is, I may be encouraged together with you while among you, each of us by the other's faith, yours and mine. What Paul is saying is this, I want to see you, I miss you, I'm praying for you, and I want to bless you, and you become a blessing to me. Do you understand that's how we should become a blessing to others and be blessed? And then Paul was very honest. Paul says, I do not want you to be un unaware. Often I have planned to come to you and have been prevented so far. Something was preventing Paul from visiting Rome. See, Rome is a very unique church. It was a church not planted by Paul. If you see the other writings of Paul, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, those churches were planted by Paul. He knew them. This is a letter to a church that he never visited before. He had nothing to do with its beginning. But he was now writing to the believers in Rome. My goodness, look at his heart. Even though I don't know you, I want to see you. Paul's mind, he wanted to make Rome the preaching base if he could go to Spain also. You see, Paul wanted to share the gospel. So he wanted to go to Rome, that I may obtain some fruit among you, even as among the rest of the Gentiles. Paul's heart is compelled to share the gospel. So, the gospel is from God, it comes from God, it's about Jesus, and you're compelled to share. You're compelled to obey him. Let's read Romans chapter 1, verse 14. Everybody read together. I am under obligation, both to Greeks and the barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. What does that mean? I am under compulsion. Can I tell you, literally, the word for obligation in the Greek language, Paul is saying, I am in debt. In Tagalog, my utang po ako. Now, the English translation, some uses the word I am in debt. Some uses the word under obligation. Notice obligation. Obligation. How do you get in debt? How do you become obligated? Simple. How many of you work with the bank? You work with banks. Raise your hand. You're a banker. Huh. 
Lahat para tayo dito, we are borrowers. We are not bankers. No? Now, listen to me. When you borrow money, when you borrow money, you become in debt. You become obligated. Yes or no? All right. But there's another way to be obligated. Where is, uh, I'll give you a demonstration. Paul, 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 come here. You know, if Paul, okay, did not borrow from the bank, how can Paul become obligated? Ah, example lang, example. Paul, this is just example, huh? Example, okay? okay. Lots of money, 10,000 pesos. Example. I will now give this to Paul. Paul, I'm entrusting this to you. You give this to JP. Okay? You give this to Pastor JP because he needs to have this money. The moment I give him the money, is she obligated now? Yes or no? Yes. Why? Because I entrusted something to him. That is what Paul is saying. <laughs> I want to make sure he doesn't forget. <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you. You know, Paul is saying, God has entrusted to me the gospel. And now I'm obligated to pass it on. Friends, until you understand this, you are obligated. You are compelled by virtue of God entrusting the gospel to you and to me. Many Christians don't understand this. They think it is optional to share the gospel. They think it is okay if you feel like sharing, if you don't feel like sharing, it's okay. It is not okay if you are a true follower of Jesus. How else can I be obligated? I want you to think of something. Assuming I had COVID, and then I discovered a cure, and I got well, and my family got well by this amazing cure. Am I obligated now to share with all the others who may have COVID? Yes or no? Why? You see, my friend, I remember the Russian doctors. Why did they roll out the vaccine quickly? The Russian doctor said, if we discover a cure, we have an obligation. Now, these are from unbelievers. They understand obligation. Paul is saying, I am under obligation. I am in debt to Greeks, to the intellectuals, to the barbarians, to rich or poor. It doesn't matter. Wise or foolish, Paul said, I'm indebted. Notice, because he understood this, for my part, I am eager. Look at this attitude. Compared. He's eager. Are you eager to share the gospel? My goodness. Let me share with you. Not only that, he says, I am not ashamed. I am not ashamed of the gospel. Are you ashamed? You know, today, you have to understand the culture of the time of Paul. Paul was laughed at. Paul was ridiculed. Do you remember Festus? Festus said, Paul, you keep talking about Jesus. You are crazy. Your education had made you crazy. You are out of your mind. When Paul was in Athens preaching the gospel, the Athenians said, Paul, ano ka ba? You know, people today, same thing. When you talk about Jesus, they may laugh at you. They may say, you still believe in that stuff? You still believe? My friend, Paul is saying, I am not ashamed. I'll be honest with you. Years ago, when I was a young Christian, you know where I put the Bible? I wrap the Bible in newspaper and I go. I go to different places with newspaper. People think I love the newspaper. Inside the newspaper is the Bible. Why was I embarrassed to go around in the university with the Bible? Ashamed. But by the grace of God, the more I learn about the gospel, the more I realize I have nothing to be ashamed of. Can I tell you why you don't have to be ashamed of anything? Notice what it says. It is the power of God. The gospel is the power of God. That is where you have the word dunamis, dynamite. This power, the Romans are fond of power. Do you understand? Because the Romans, they understand. Rome, the greatest city, 
the most powerful capital, the most powerful empire. They understood military power. They understood political power. They understand economic power. But what they don't understand is the power of God to change the hearts of people. You see, the greatest power, if you ask me, is the power of God through Jesus to change our heart. Once upon a time, my heart was cold. I don't want to have anything to do with God. But something happened. The gospel is powerful. It changes heart. It heals the broken hearted. It doesn't matter what you have done in the past. Broken families, the gospel can heal. The gospel can restore. And that is amazing power. But there's a condition to that power. Look at this verse. I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. You see, the gospel is offered to everyone. But what is the condition? Believe. You must believe. The power, the gospel is the power of God to save us from what? Salvation is a big picture, okay? Save us from what? I want you to see this chart. Salvation. What is the gospel saving us from? Penalty of sin. That's the wrath of God. When you understand the gospel, you are saved from the wrath of God, from the judgment of God. Next week, we will discuss this topic, the wrath of God. What in the world does it mean? How can God be wrathful? How can God be angry? Isn't that not right? That's where most people don't understand. The holiness of God and the wrath of God, the righteousness of God and the anger of God, the love of God and His righteous anger do not conflict. In fact, you need to understand the wrath of God. If you don't understand the wrath of God, you will never take God seriously. Are you ready for next week? All right, pray for me. I'm going I'm to teach you from the Bible. Romans chapter 1 from 18 down. Okay, that's, that's the idea of penalty of sin. And then the, the theological term is called justification. Now God is saving you today, right now, present tense. He's saving you from the power of sin. Believe it or not, God wants you to have victory. God wants you to overcome your temper. God wants to overcome your addiction. Whatever problem you may have, sexual addiction, pornography, computer games, Whatever it is, for some people, our biggest problem is selfishness. We are self-centered. That is what God is doing now. Sanctification. God will save you. He's saving you right now. You are being transformed. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know, saints, you are being transformed to be like Christ. And lastly, someday, you will be saved from the presence of sin. No more temptation. Someday, in the meantime, right now, where are we? Some of you have not experienced this yet. You have never experienced the reality that your sins have been forgiven. Some of you have experienced forgiveness, but you are struggling. You are here. I have good news for you. Study with us together the power of God to transform lives. Notice, the last verse for today, the Bible tells us, the gospel, in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the righteous man shall live by faith. How in the world is the gospel of God revealing the righteousness of God? The Bible says the gospel is the power of God, right? There is power to save us. Then it reveals the righteousness of God. What does it mean, the righteousness of God revealed in the gospel? When you see the word, God is righteous, I want you to know something. The righteousness of God, when described in the book of Romans, is not just about the character of God. It is not just about what he does is perfection. Yes, God's righteousness. Everything he does is always correct. God is perfectly righteous. It's more than that. You will learn in Romans chapter 3 
that the righteousness of God also means how he forgave us is righteous. How God saved us is righteous. Why? Because justice and love met at the cross. Justice and mercy. Jesus paid the penalty for our sins. That is justice. Sin must be paid for. There is forgiveness. That is the righteousness of God in declaring you righteous. But more than that, this will blow your mind. When the Bible says the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, you acquire the righteousness of God also. It blows my mind. When I study the Bible, wow, you mean to tell me God gives me his righteousness? Yes. Paul talks about two kinds of righteousness. Philippians chapter 2. Let's read this, chapter 3. Two kinds of righteousness. Paul said, I may be found in him. Everybody, please read. Not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law. Paul is saying there's a kind of righteousness that comes from human effort. You try to obey the law. You try to avoid sin. You try to do good works. That is one kind of righteousness. But you know what? That righteousness will not be enough to bring you to heaven. Why? Because you will never be good enough. Let me repeat. The righteousness of my own derived from the law will never be good enough. But through, everybody read, but that which is through faith in Christ, everybody read aloud, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. What does that mean? It simply means this. Guys, your own righteousness will never be good enough. But when you come to Jesus, God is saying, your old life is dead. He gives you a new life. Jesus. Jesus is now your righteousness. When God sees you, he does not see your sin. He sees Christ. Wow! That's how righteous you are. That's why you are called saint. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Let's read this together. Together. But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. So that it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Let me explain. The Bible says, but by, louder. Who's doing? God. It is God at work. Do you realize Tom Morillo has no business becoming a father of Jesus? But in God's wisdom, he can use everything. By his doing, you are now in Jesus. And because you are in Jesus, everybody, Jesus became what? To us, our wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Now, let me ask you, have you experienced the righteousness that comes from God through faith? And that, my friend, is the amazing thing about the gospel of God. It comes from Him. He did not, He was not forced. It is about Jesus, centered on Jesus. And what is the third C? It compels you to change. It compels you to share. C, 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 P, R. There is power, the power to change you. And it is about the righteousness of God in you. Triple C, P, R. You can make somebody dead spiritually. You can make him alive spiritually. How? C, P, R. The gospel. Amen? Now, before I close, I want you to realize something. The Christian life begins by faith. Notice what it says, okay? Romans 1.17. Understand this verse. The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. You begin the Christian life by faith. You will end it by faith. Many people think, I received Jesus Christ by faith, and now I sustain my Christian life by works, by self-effort. No, no, no. From beginning to end, it's all faith. I begin my relationship with God by faith. I will sustain my relationship with God by faith. I keep trusting Him. And someday, someday, all of us, as you leave this world and you see Jesus, you are sustained by faith. It's never faith 
to works. No, no. It's faith, faith, faith. But the evidence of faith is what you will learn in the book of Romans. Faith without works is dead. Faith to faith. Together, for by grace, you have been saved through faith. Not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Not as a result of works that no one can boast. The Bible says we are saved. Notice a certainty by grace through faith. So that you will understand what it means, the gospel of God. What are the CPR again? What is the first one? Comes from God. The first C comes from God. What's the next one? Christ-centered. It's all about Christ. What's the third one? It compels us. It compels us to change. It compels us to share. Like Paul, I am not ashamed. I am obligated. And what is the P? You know why he's not ashamed? There's power. Power to save. And lastly, it's the righteousness of God revealed through faith. From end to end, it's all by faith. Therefore, what is faith? You will learn in Romans as we study. But let me give you advance. Faith is simply acknowledging I cannot save myself. I will trust in the promises of God. I will trust in Jesus. I will surrender my life. You will never surrender your life to somebody you don't have faith. So I show you a chart as we close. The difference between the gospel and religion. Religion and the gospel. What is religion? It is man's way to find God. Man's effort. What is the gospel? It's God's way to find us. The gospel through Jesus. What is religion? Salvation is by works. You need to earn it. What is the gospel? Salvation is by grace. You don't deserve it. It's a gift. But somebody paid for the gift. Jesus. Religion is legalism. I got to do this. I got to do that. And some of you are still in that mode. Legalistic mode. That's why you don't enjoy your relationship with God. You think God is angry at you all the time. Faith. What Christ has done for me. Do you know what Christ has done for you? He died on the cross to pay for all of your sins. And he rose again from the dead. And what is the last one? What does it say? Uncertain. You know, religion will never assure you of salvation. What about the gospel? Assurance of heaven. Now let me ask you. What do you have? Religion or the gospel? I want to give you a chance today. If you are touched by the gospel of God and you finally understood the gospel of God, it's from Him. He loves you. Will you pray with me? I want to give you a chance to pray, to accept the gospel of God, that is Jesus Christ, by faith. You tell Him to be your Savior. Let's bow our heads. If you desire to accept Jesus, to accept the gospel by faith today. Will you quietly raise your hand as I pray for you? Praise God. Anybody else? Raise your hand. You and Jesus. Raise your hand because I'm going to ask you to pray with me. God is looking down and He's saying, are you serious in wanting me to be your Savior? Now, you do it by faith, from beginning to end by faith. All right? I want you to raise your hands up and you pray with me sitting down. Or you pray with me sitting down, but you pray aloud with me. Okay? Those of you who raise your hands, you pray. Lord Jesus, I admit I'm a sinner. I believe you died on the cross to pay for all of my sins. Today, by faith, I invite you to be my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, come into my life. I accept your forgiveness. I place my faith, my trust in your promises. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. Will you change my heart? Will you change my life? I surrender my all to you. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen and amen. Now, I'm not yet done. To those of you who raise their hands now, I will pray for you. I want you to stand up. Okay? If you raise your hand, you pray to receive Christ, you stand up. I want to pray for you. It's never too late, okay? To those of you, you know why I want you to stand up? I want you to make a public confession. 
that you have come to Jesus today. The Bible says, if you are ashamed of me before men, God says, I'll be ashamed of you. But if you are not ashamed of me before men, today you're willing to declare today you committed by faith to follow Jesus, to be your Lord and Savior, stand up. Anybody else? Praise God. You see, I always know. God is always speaking in your heart. That's the amazing thing about the gospel. It is from God, invented by God, not us. Anybody else? Before I pray for all of these guys standing, praise God. It's never too late. Anybody else? God is looking down and He's saying, Are you willing to make a stand by faith? Anybody else? My friend, salvation is given, not by mental belief. Is when you ask for it by faith. Lord Jesus, I thank you for this group of men and women who are standing. I pray that you now affirm their salvation. Assure them it is your righteousness in us that brings us to heaven, not us. I thank you that they are willing to make a stand for you. Will you now help them to grow? by learning to follow you day by day, by learning to study the Bible, and above all, by resting in what you have done for them and not what they will do to impress you. Lord, I cannot do anything to impress you. I can only do things out of my love for you. So help us to love you. When we go to worship, it's because we love you. When we study the Bible, it's because we love you. It's because you love us. Help us to live a life of love which will result in a life of holiness. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen and amen. God bless you guys.